Hello everyone, welcome to the afternoon session of this great conference. I'm a biological physicist and it's a great pleasure to chair the afternoon session uh, as a microscopist as well, because as you know, everything that a physicist discovers gets used to study biology from microscopes, <laughs> rubber hook to x-rays, to understand the structure of proteins, to magnetic resonance that we're gonna see later, and indeed, quantum physics that we're gonna see later. Medicine, sensors, computing, everything is based on, in many ways, the way that physicists look at biology, because physics is about understanding reality, and understanding reality involves understanding ourselves, and hence our biology. Uh, so, we have a talk about imaging, which is one of the main contributions of physics and biology, and I'm very happy. Uh, to welcome Martin Graves uh, to talk about shadows and signals, a brief history of medical imaging. Thank you very much indeed, and uh, thank you very much to uh, the St. Cross Centre for inviting me. So, what is medical imaging? Well, firstly, it's the ability to see inside the human body and potentially inside organs as well. Uh, and ideally non-invasively, although, uh, of course, we do uh, do some kind of minimally invasive methods sometimes to get access. Maybe we'll touch on those as we go through. And, of course, seeing using medical imaging generally involves some non-optical methods to acquire the data before that information is then put into a suitable format for uh, viewing by a clinician, typically a radiologist, although, of course, many other clinicians involved in looking at images as well. The main things I'm going to talk about in the next uh, 30 minutes are really going to be X-rays, computed tomography, ultrasound, nuclear medicine techniques and magnetic resonance imaging. Um, but of course there are plenty of optical methods as well out there, uh, the various oscopies, endoscopy, colonoscopy, bronchoscopy, hopefully not too many people in the room have had the experience of one of those in a, an orifice, but uh, there are plenty of uh, optical methods as well. Uh, and really the whole op the objective is to identify the normal and, if possible, the abnormal. And of course, uh, really we want to be able to support both the uh, treatment planning and therapeutic monitoring. So how do we see inside the body? Well, really, we use the same way as we see anything. We've heard a bit about the eye already uh, this morning. So we're using waves. And waves we just think of as a propagating dynamic disturbance of one or more quantities. So we're, people are probably quite familiar with mechanical waves, where we have a medium, uh, such as you know, atoms and molecules, and we've got sound waves, and as we'll talk about in ultrasound, higher frequency waves beyond normal hearing, water, seismic waves as well. And then, of course, we have electromagnetic waves. These can propagate through empty space. Yeah, or in a vacuum. So we have uh, visible light, which we are seeing with uh, today. We have radio waves at one end of the spectrum, microwaves, and then at the other end, X-rays, gamma rays, for example. So really, we are going to use the range of that uh, spectrum to produce our medical images. And then also, we're going to look at matter waves, a third type of waves that's there. Uh, and again, many of you may be familiar with this whole sort of concept of wave-particle duality, where we can think of photons as not being waves, as well as sort of packets of, uh, of, of a certain duration. Uh, and say, electrons as well, we may think of them as these little uh, things orbiting the nucleus, but again, we can think of these as also having a wave property as well. So uh, Steve already stole my thunder a little bit. Uh, if we go back to the first uh, medical image, uh, which was uh, done on the 27th of the 12th, 1895. So uh, uh, my history of physics is uh, only going to be about 139 years uh, for my session. So it was on the 8th of November, uh, 1885, that uh, our friend here, as you've already seen, uh, Wilhelm Conrad Wundgen, uh, a German engineer and physicist, he was professor of physics at Würzburg University, uh, produced and detected highly penetrating rays. 
Uh, he was doing some experiments with a cathode ray tube where he was looking at these cathode rays, which we now know to be these little beams of electrons. But he found that even if he covered his uh, Crookes tube at the time with cardboard, uh, and uh, some distance away, he actually had a barium scintillator that, uh, that started to flash when he uh, discharged his Crookes tube. So he clearly knew that uh, this wasn't going to be his cathode rays that he was seeing, but something else, another form of, uh, uh, of radiation, which he uh, called X-rays, although a number of his colleagues went on to call them uh, Röntgen rays, in, uh, in, uh, even though he was against it, but uh, they called them Röntgen rays after him. Uh, and he was uh, given the first Nobel Prize in 1901, uh, in recognition of his extraordinary services he has rendered by the discoveries of the remarkable rays subsequently named after him. And there, that typical image that he took is actually of his wife's uh, hand, uh, Bertha, uh, and I think she said uh, something to the effects of, now I've seen death, uh, seeing her own bones. Uh, just one slide on, on the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, going way back to 1862 when James Clark Maxwell concluded that light was an electromagnetic wave and uh, he predicted that there was actually going to be an infinite range of frequencies. Uh, just picking out things like Hertz in 1886 generated and detected uh, radio waves and then later microwaves. And um, although Röntgen uh, identified these or uh, found these, discovered these X-rays, they were subsequently identified that also part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So here's the spectrum. We have the visible light range here, which we're obviously very used to, but then here, in increasing energy, much shorter wavelengths, we have uh, X-rays and gamma rays with radio waves uh, coming down at the much longer end of the wavelength and lower energies. So... X-ray formation, so really we're just looking here at a beam of X-rays being attenuated as they pass through the body or the objects, and then this attenuation that happens is dependent upon the X-ray photon energy and the atomic number of the tissues or the elements that are present. So we know that bones and calcium have quite a high density, and therefore they attenuate these X-rays very well, and hence we end up with these shadows on our films. Um, so here are two X-ray images have really been uh, created using uh, film, um, but now they're more directly or indirectly uh, use digital detectors to take them. So here's a, probably a typical uh, chest X-ray setup. Now here's a digital detector here, this uh, patient having a chest X-ray. Here's the X-ray tube, and again, here's the anatomy. You can see the, the heart here and the lungs, and there's the standard chest X-ray where we can see the outline of the heart here, and we can see the lung fields here. And if you're a highly trained radiologist, you can uh, start to spot uh, abnormalities in these and hence determine the pathology. But of course, this is a two-dimensional projection. Uh, more advanced, even after, very shortly after Röntgen uh, discovered X-rays, uh, people started having, uh, doing live experiments, simply having a scintillator uh, on a transparent piece of card, holding it up to the eyes with the X-ray beam going straight into the eyes. Not recommended to do that at home. Uh, but you could then actually start to see things happening. So this is a kind of, this is similar kind of approach now, but this is a modern-day X-ray coronary angiography, where, again, we have uh, an X-ray uh, detector here, a flat panel... Sorry, an X-ray source here, a flat panel detector here, which rotates around the patient. And here we can clearly see the patient's coronary anatomy by injecting, we talked about sort of minimally invasive, actually injecting a high atomic number iodine-based contrast agent or contrast media into the blood vessels. Selectively there, you can see, for example, the left coronary artery and a number of narrowings there. So this may account for the, uh, the angina that this particular patient was experiencing. And there's a little zoom up of that rear. So that should be a nice, normal calibre vessel, but we've got these multiple stenosis in here. Uh, and of course, there really has been a major shift away from uh, the old days of uh, analogue 
X-ray film here and film libraries that we used to have and uh, a way of communicating those around the hospital uh, via trolleys and uh, radiography assistants. And now a lot of this information is uh, stored in picture archive and communication systems where we have uh, high quality display monitors for looking at the uh, gray levels in those images at quite high resolution with maybe over 10 megapixels uh, for a chest x-ray. Large archives, I think the current archive in Cambridge is something like uh, 70 terabytes of medical images and of course the ubiquitous network to transfer it around. So we said the big problem really was though that these are projection images and it was really a lot of, lot of interest uh, in trying to think about how we could actually create cross-sectional images of these and uh, in 59, William Ohlendorf, who's an American neurologist, came up with the idea of uh, scanning ahead through a transmitted beam of X-rays and being able to reconstruct the radio density patterns of the plane through the head. So, you know, something that we think, oh, this is actually really quite an amazing kind of idea that he had. Uh, unfortunately, when he took it to a, uh, a leading medical equipment vendor, their reply was, we cannot imagine an apparatus or imagine a significant market for such an expensive apparatus which could do nothing but make a radiographic cross-section of a head. We, I don't look quite sure what company that was and whether they're still in business or not, but uh, that uh, was how it was. So really, um, thanks to uh, uh, Alan Cormack, uh, a... Uh, a South African physicist in 63 and 64 published a sort of mathematical framework for CT reconstruction. He was unaware of some previous work that had been done by somebody called Johan Radon in 1917. So uh, Cormac did a lot of theoretical work, but as again I'm sure you're aware of, uh, we had our own uh, Godfrey Hounsfield uh, working for EMI in the UK who actually ended up designing and constructing the very first CT scanner. And the, uh, the first clinical image was acquired at uh, Atkinson Morley's Hospital in Wimbledon in London on the 1st of October 1971. Uh, so it was quite clear that Ollendorf sort of gave up with it really when he was given that response and uh, didn't uh, come back into uh, the idea of doing anything uh, with uh, CT. Um, so unfortunately he never uh, actually got uh, nominated for the Nobel Prize in there. Some people think there was some uh, nefarious dealings, but uh, I'll lead you to read the literature about that. Um, uh, interestingly, uh, there were thoughts that uh, EMI funded all this work through their revenue from the Beatles, um, but uh, apparently that, uh, that's also a bit of a, an apocryphal story, and they, uh, most of the money actually came from uh, the then Department of Health and Social Security. <laughs> Uh, but uh, fortunately, they did get quite a lot of returns. Uh, in fact, EMI built a number of scanners for the DHSS, so they, uh, they paid for them before they'd even been built. Uh, I can't imagine the NHS today doing that kind of thing. Um, and this is really the, the first CT scanner. My animation has blown up there horrendously, so I should have sorted that out. But there's the first uh, image with this uh, tumour that you can see here. Uh, this was the first CT scanner that I've now masked by this because I was going to say that it, they actually took the data away and they had to reconstruct it back at the EMI uh, laboratories um, and so they took it away on tape and people may think, oh, that was magnetic tape, but it wasn't actually, it was paper tape, if people remember back to that, uh, that time period. Um, so CT simply works by taking a projection through the images and here is an idea, we have an X-ray source here casting uh, parallel rays through the object here, and here's a sort of one-dimensional projection, or again, a shadow of what we have uh, uh, detected through there, and there's that one-dimensional projection here, and if we put our space into rotation angle here, and uh, diameter or radius across here, essentially like polar coordinates, if we rotate that around, then we can, take, you know, we can convert that line to a sort of uh, uh, the line of an image, and if we fill that all the way through, then we, got, we get what's called a sinogram. And if we put the whole thing together there, you can see that as we go around, we generate this sinogram, and it's from that sinogram that then we can do the reconstruction process uh, that um, Cormac uh, described. Uh, there's a typical modern CT scanner, and just really to, to show you the... Uh, 
the incredible engineering that goes on in here. So here's the detector array, here's the X-ray tube, here's our fan beam, and if the, uh, the movie decides to go for me... An audio-visual experience for this. But when that spins up now, that's doing 0.3 seconds per rotation. So that's going around at 180 RPM. So it's pulling something like 15 G there with that gantry that's weighing you know, just over 2,500 kilograms. So quite amazing engineering that goes in now into to modern CT scanners. And here's really the idea of the reconstruction. Say so I mentioned Johan Radon before. Um, they weren't... Uh, or, um, they weren't familiar with the work that Radon did, really, which was talking about uh, this kind of reconstruction. Of course, Radon wasn't thinking about uh, uh, medical imaging at the time, but again, there is this mathematical transformation which will take that sinogram image and then essentially back project that through to give us our final image. And of course, we also acquire this data in multi-slice, so we have a single slice, but then we normally have a range of detectors, a number of detectors in there, which allows us to get multiple slices through the anatomy of interest. And again, just to give you a few examples of typical kind of CT images that you may see, this is one poor unfortunate uh, uh, patient uh, at Adam Brooks recently who had uh, quite severe blunt force trauma. This is just uh, windowing the data slightly differently. Here you can see the blood uh, in, the, uh, in the skull, and here it's an intracranial hemorrhage. But here, hopefully, you can just see that uh, there's quite uh, some broken bones in the skull. So we normally acquire the slices in this axial fashion through the head. Uh, we can then, because the, uh, the voxels are almost isotropic, we can reformat those into 3D. You can see there, and we can then also use these typical kind of computer graphics techniques so you can see clearly here on this 3D rendering that depressed fracture of the skull. Uh, and that's kind of typical CT quality that can be obtained these days. This is an example of uh, CT angiography. So again, we're acquiring data, but this time also having put this iodinated contrast media into the patient, and now you can see the, uh, the vessels inside the, the aorta, the iliac arteries coming down here, and in this, so there's the aortic arch coming over from the heart just here, and as it comes down, you can see this patient has actually got a crossover graft. So here, this is actually a graft put in by a vascular surgeon uh, because they obviously had some issue with uh, the blood flow in their legs. And then you saw the previous coronary artery from the X-ray projection. This again is again sort of state-of-the-art CT coronary angiography. So three-dimensional images, but really with extremely good, better than uh, half millimetre spatial resolution, where you can clearly identify the coronary arteries and veins wrapping around the heart. So trying to move swiftly on to nuclear medicine imaging, this was really sort of developed in the sort of late 1950s uh, and really primarily due to, to the work of this chap here, George D. Havisi, who was awarded the 1943 Nobel Prize for chemistry. And it all works around the basis of radiopharmaceuticals, drugs where we use radioactive isotopes to actually track the, uh, the progress or the path of those drugs through the body. So we may actually see where the drugs get taken up in particular physiologies area. And the good thing is that these drugs are uh, injected in very, very low concentrations. So we don't actually upset the physiology of the situation that's there. Um, and the drugs themselves are gamma ray emitters. So uh, we can detect those gamma rays with a gamma or scintillation camera that was typically, or that was originally developed by this chap here, Hal Anger. And then we can also combine the, uh, the drugs with the radiation component with it to a combined imaging and therapy process known as theranostics. And here's just one example of a nuclear medicine scan. This is again the heart. Uh, this is a particular agent uh, labelled with uh, 99M uh, technetium, which is a gamma ray emitter. And you can see that uh, when we stress this patient, uh, either by exercise or by giving them some kind of uh, pharmacological stress agent, that there is an absence of bright signal down here. 
So this uh, Sestamibi agent actually gets taken up in the mitochondria, and here where this patient has an ischemic event, when they're resting, sitting down nicely, quite relaxed, there's no problem, but once they start to exert exercise, they then may have a flow-limiting stenosis in one of those coronary arteries, and hence we get uh, little uptake in this region. And again, that helps with the doctors for planning subsequent procedures. In terms of technology, uh, we have... One particular method, which is this uh, gamma cameras. This is a sort of the modern version of the Anger camera that uh, was developed uh, back in the 50s or late 50s. So this is a so-called single photon emission computed tomography or a SPECT gamma camera. And the idea here is that we have our patient and they are throwing off these gamma rays and these gamma rays cause uh, these ionization events here, typically in a sodium iodide crystal and then we will have either a photomultiplier tube or more, sort of the more recently um, proper solid state detectors from here. So they can actually detect where these signals come from. We'll have a lead collimator here, which uh, eliminates the signals from uh, uh, sort of uh, rays or gamma rays that come off at uh, strange angles, really. We just want to try and get the ones that are coming off pretty straight from the anatomy and then, obviously, we get a reconstruction, which is also in 3D. And again, this is now a slightly different uh, variant, which is very good for looking at bone scans. Uh, so if you've actually got uh, you know, lesions in the bones, uh, this kind of uh, nuclear medicine agent is used for that. Uh, then we come on to positron emission tomography. Uh, developed about 1973, and this now also allows us to get tomographic slices, um, but this time we're using uh, tracers, typically which are a radioactive form of glucose, so over here. So we have uh, fluorine 18 at this point, and fluorine 18 decays by emitting a positron. So one of the protons converts to a neutron uh, with a positron, and this positron then will annihilate with another one, with an electron. Bang, there they go. And they form two 511 keV uh, photons uh, from you know, Einstein's uh, equation there. And these two photons are produced approximately 180 degrees apart. So there is FDG, but there are other uh, radioactive uh, or PETS radioactive isotopes available. And again, the camera itself was developed by uh, these three back in uh, 1973 at the University of Washington. Michael, uh, Michel Terpogosian, Michael Phelps and uh, Ed Hoffman. And really the idea is that uh, you now have a ring of detectors around the patient, normally something uh, like lutetium. And I don't know if you can just see that on the screen, if I just move the cursor there. There's a little uh, pin source just there. And the idea is that you get these two photons occurring, you get a so-called line of response, and then we can take that line of response and then work out uh, by taking multiple ones of them exactly where, using back projection, where that uh, event came from. And again, some of the latest PET detectors can actually look at the differences in time between these two 180-degree photons arriving. They have a coincidence detection which is better than 500 picoseconds. And then we can take that uh, data there. And then again, we similarly use that uh, PET reconstruction kind of idea that we have before. There's our sinogram of our one sample. But if we take the first few projections and then we start adding in some more of those, you can see now that we actually get back to the location of that original uh, sample. Um, we normally combine PET images with CT. The CT technique really allows us to spatially localise the PET signal. PET itself probably has an intrinsic resolution of uh, a few millimetres due to that uh, electron and positron annihilation. So we have a, a CT image here. Here's the PET uh, image, and we can see some lesions. For example, there's one up here. Uh, there's a very large lesion in the liver here. So this is really looking at the uptake of glucose in these tumours. And uh, here, if we look at the static images, we can see then by fusing those together, because we've acquired them at uh, the same time interval, although we've pushed the patient through the uh, PET ring into a CT ring, you can clearly now get uh, an overlay of these two or a fused image of these 
which clearly shows you the anatomy with that functional uptake information of the sugar. Ultrasound also was uh, quite a lot of work, as well as a number of people really involved in ultrasound. We'll maybe just focus particularly on the ones uh, from the, uh, the UK. Uh, Ian Donald was uh, particularly um, uh, instrumental in this work in Glasgow. Uh, and he worked with a, an engineer called Tom Brown, who uh, worked for Messrs. Kelvin and Hughes. Uh, we've already heard about Lord Kelvin, so this is one of the companies that uh, he set up at the time. And uh, between them, uh, he knew that Ian Donald wanted to start uh, being able to look at cysts inside patients. Uh, and Tom Brown was looking at using ultrasound to investigate the, the welds in, uh, in pressure vessels as part of the shipyard work. Um, uh, and together, uh, they, they came up with this first... Uh, uh, sort of scanning ultrasound system. This is the diasonograph used at the Queen Mother's Hospital in York Hill in the mid-1960s. Um, but uh, just to show you, that's what a typical uh, ultrasound system these days can look like. Uh, you actually just have a single probe like this, and the rest of it can be displayed on your mobile phone. So we've gone quite a long way between the two. So ultrasound image formation essentially relies on the reflection of our very high frequency acoustic waves that come from that uh, piezoelectric uh, transducer, which I showed you there. Uh, so we have a simple equation for the wavelength equal the, uh, the velocity of sound in the tissue over the frequency. So if we have a typical velocity of sound in tissue of about 1,500 metres per second, then we get a resolution of about 1.5 millimetres using this one megahertz transducer. And again, I'll probably show you this in a moment, but you'll get some reflection and some transmission of the ultrasound beam. So if we just uh, look up on here, so here's our pulse of ultrasound energy coming through. That reflects from here, and then we get another one reflecting back from the other side of this particular tissue organ there. So again, we can then build up by steering that beam across the area. We can end up with images like this. For example, here you can see the quality of the images in the liver and the kidney. This is the kind of idea. Here we have a radiologist uh, looking at the screen. His hand is on the probe here, and so he's not looking at the patient at all. He's just moving the probe around the patient's skin. And again, really very high quality images. I'm sure people are very familiar with obstetric ultrasound, uh, but we can also if just go back, show you the, uh, the anatomy here on this so-called echocardiography, looking at the heart. This is the right ventricle. Here's the left ventricle. This is the mitral valve between left ventricle and left atrium. Here's the aorta, and here's the aortic valve. So if we just run that again, you can just see really what kind of temporal and spatial resolution, how well we can see the, the motion of those valves in the heart. So that brings me, hopefully, with a few minutes to go, uh, onto the area that I know slightly more than the other areas of nuclear magnetic resonance imaging. Um, so this really, the nuclear part means that this concerns the nucleus of an atom, both protons and neutrons. The magnetic part means that these nuclei um, behave like little tiny microscopic bar magnets. And then we have this resonance condition where the, 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 the natural precession of the nuclei, which I'll show you in a moment, matches with an external driving form, force. And therefore we get a, uh, an increased amplitude of the vibration. Uh, and then imaging is primarily looking at, the no at um, images of uh, the protons in the body. We've already heard that you know, we're, uh, there's a lot of water in the body, so uh, we can use a MRI to look at that water signal. And again, a few Nobel Prizes work I'm going to have to uh, zip through here, uh, but primarily uh, the invention of MR imaging was really um, down to the work of uh, the late pro Professor Sir Peter Mansfield at Nottingham, uh, as well as Paul Lauterbur at the State University of New York. Uh, back in 2003. And again, EMI featured quite heavily in this. It was actually in 1978 that uh, uh, EMI went on from their successes with the CT uh, scanner to actually uh, produce the first uh, NMR scan of a head, which is here using this uh, Neptune system, which was installed in Hammersmith Hospital in 1981. So just to... Uh, Roughly show the idea here. So there's a water molecule. So it's, uh, we're looking at the centre of this. I know I'm going as fast as I can. 
there is a hydrogen nucleus there with its uh, surrounding electron. But again, if we just ignore the electron, because we've got a spinning positive charge, we can think of that as a tiny little bar magnet. Uh, and that bar magnet then, we can just represent that as a uh, that spinning charge with a magnetic moment. And if we put that into an external magnetic field, then it will start to process. And it processes with a very uh, uh, strictly known frequency, which is given by the product of that static magnetic field and the gyromagnetic um, ratio, which for hydrogen is about 42.57 megahertz. So again, it's a bit like a child's gyroscope. And if we take a lot of these in a body, and we actually put the body inside a strong magnetic field, like a 3T clinical MR scanner, what you'll find is that, uh, again, due to Boltzmann statistics we heard about just before lunch, we'll actually get a distribution of nuclei, or we'll get slightly more pointing in the direction of the static magnetic field compared to those in the opposite direction. So we just have a very small uh, net magnetization. So we only think that's going to be very hard to detect, but we need to think that even in a drop of water, we're probably dealing with around 10 to the 21 protons. So we, the whole idea of the resonance is that we can tip our net magnetization into the transverse plane, so it's orthogonal to the direction of our static magnetic field, by applying an RF frequency. So we're down here in the radio waves. We're not directly uh, imaging this as we do with, uh, with X-rays. And then we can actually detect the signal that's coming back if we turn off that radio frequency. And those signals allow us to actually, uh, with the use of magnetic field gradients, to spatially localize the signal. So one example here, if I just put a, a magnetic field gradient on, so that's why we get that knocking noise in MRI, uh, you can see that with the gradient, because we have slightly different magnetic fields at each position, we have uh, different processional frequencies. And if we look at these in terms of sound, we can see a low frequency, slightly higher frequency, and an even higher frequency. But of course, we get the signal from both, or from all three of those, and it's very hard to tell those apart. But by the magic of the Fourier transformation, which takes a signal and can decompose it into its frequency components, we can end up with three spikes. So that's how we do our spatial localization. And this is a, a typical MRI imaging sequence where we acquire raw data and uh, doing the Fourier transformation you can see the image appearing and again a lot of this work was originally done at the University of Aberdeen um, who uh, did quite well really out of the original patents for this particular type of imaging. So the signal recovers and that's what gives rise to a different uh, contrasts. Some beautiful MRI images where we can go from whole body right down to looking at the semicircular canals. And of course, nothing, uh, I can't really give a talk these days without including the role of artificial intelligence now in medical imaging, where we can do things like uh, detect fractures, look at lesions in the breast, denoise images, or even segment tissues. So, in summary, x rays, so you really did launch the uh, field of non invasive diagnostics. CT introduced the idea of cross sectional imaging. Ultrasound allowed us to get uh, very safe fetal development and other point of care applications. Nuclear medicine for physiological function. MRI improved tissue morphology and also gave us additional functional information. I think artificial intelligence is where we're going now, which enables enhanced image quality as well as diagnostic support. Thank you. Thank you. A bit for questions. Questions from the audience. Yes, the first one. When you showed us examples of the earliest images of ultrasound and MRI, um, they're quite rough. Mm. How useful actually were they clinically? <laughs> they were certainly useful enough that uh, the, the companies and the, uh, the radiologists were prepared to drive it through. Um, I think when... Um, uh, the, the original prototype of uh, Godfrey Hounsfields was shown. Um, I think a number of radiologists just said, what a load of rubbish, and walked away. But luckily there were certainly a, a radiologist at um, uh, Atkinson Morley Hospital who could, you know, could see the potential of that and continue to, to do that. 
So it does require foresight of the clinicians and the companies. I mean, the companies won't do it really unless the radiologists want it. So the biggest thing is, yeah, finding an engaged radiologist to really drive it through. And how soon did we get to the sort of standards that we have today? Well, so, you know, MRI really started in 1980. Um, and, yeah, the images were fairly low resolution, fairly the sort of kind of quality that was there. But, you know, within 20 or 30 years, I mean, it's just incredible what we can do now. So it's probably, you know, 10 years till you get a really good image. And now, you know, Steve and I, Steve occasionally, because he's a very busy man, you know, we go off to international conferences where, you know, every year people are coming up with, you know, cool new ideas and image contrasts in MRI. Thanks. Martin, excellent talk, as always. And you know I'm a partner in crime with you. I've known this industry since I was knee-high to a grasshopper. And um, from the 80s to now, we've been watching the progress of diagnostic imaging. And we've, you've highlighted all the wonderful benefits of it. But I need to caveat this. And you know my hat that I wear, the safety issue of this. There's a risk versus benefit with this mm. as well. And clearly, people shouldn't get complacent that these kind of imaging, there's a lot of safety concerns behind this. And so perhaps you'd like to highlight some of those to people. Yeah, sure. Um, of course, you know, the, the CT and the X-ray technologies that we're dealing with are ionizing radiation. You know, they do cause DNA damage. And there is probably, you know, a one in 2,000 chance, something like that, of CT actually inducing a cancer. But of course, you weigh that up against the benefit of being able to get those images. You know, MRI and ultrasound, we think as being safe imaging modalities. The big safety risks that we have with MRI scanners is there is a very strong magnetic field. And even today, 2023, I don't know, I haven't heard any 2024 so far, but in 2023, patients are still being killed by MRI scanners, by people taking ferromagnetic objects into the room where you've got a 1.5 or a 3 Tesla magnet, and that is slamming in there. The sentinel event for MRI safety was a poor uh, young boy called Michael Columbini uh, in New York, who uh, um, basically a nurse brought an oxygen cylinder into the room, uh, and the technologist, the radiographer, who should have been managing the situation, was called away to something else and that oxygen cylinder was sucked into the bore, struck him on the head, and he subsequently died. So, you know, we take MRI safety very seriously. We have teams of physicists in ionising radiation looking very carefully at the doses that you get from those X-ray machines and stuff like that. So, you know, certainly in the, in the UK and in, in the, most of the developed world, there is a very clear safety... Uh, uh, consciousness that goes with all of these imaging modalities. Hopefully that's good enough. Thank you. Hi, thanks for your talk. It was, uh, it was really good. Um, I'm in medical physics myself. I found it really interesting. Oh, excellent. Um, good career choice. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was just uh, telling my grandma how I've read from picture to proton as well, so now all about that. Um, Other MRI textbooks are available. <laughs> yeah. But... Yeah, well. Um, anyway, um, my question is, so you talked about how um, artificial intelligence is very much like the next step, so to speak. But is there another sort of type of physical process, enti something entirely new that could be used for diagnosis or people are sort of muttering about? So that's a very good and interesting question. Um, I think uh, when Ohlendorf uh, didn't get his uh, Nobel Prize or wasn't put in for the Nobel Prize, he was asked... What, uh, what the next big uh, imaging modality was going to be. And I think his response was clairvoyance. <laughs> so um, I think we've, we've pretty much covered most of the electromagnetic spectrum uh, that's there. And, you know, we've had dalliances with sort of terahertz imaging and stuff like that that is pretty good just, you know, if you want to look at sort of skin-type lesions. Um, but I don't think... I mean, it's an interesting question. Uh, there was an interesting article by... Uh, um, uh, the, the, the Hammersmith group who said that would MRI have been developed um, if it hadn't come hot on the heels of CT, really, or would it have just been a, a curiosity that remained? Given today's regulatory environment, things like that, and the safety concerns that we have, 
he was proposing that, you know, maybe that would never have happened. So I'm not aware of anything, maybe other people in this room are working on something, but it's very hush-hush, um, but I'm not aware of anything that's going to make that kind of substantial uh, difference. And again, even if there was, I think there will be such a regulatory hurdle around it um, that it may not be something that manufacturers are prepared to put money in. I mean, there's still huge amounts of money going into the development of CT. You know, we're now getting into the realm of actually counting individual photons, photon counting CT. You know, we're going way up in field strength for MRI. University of Nottingham are proposing 11.7 Tesla whole body scanner for there, as well as going down in field strength with 0.64 milli or 64 milli Tesla point of care MR scanners now. And before we'd say, well, the image quality is going to be rubbish with something that low field. But with the advent of deep learning, artificial intelligence, the image quality, yeah, it's not going to be as good as the three Tesla, but if you actually need to take the MRI scanner to the patient for whatever reason, that's it. So I still think there's a huge realm of things that can be done. You know, an ultrasound, which is now you know, in your hand. That's all you need, an ultrasound and a mobile phone or a probe and a mobile phone, connected via Bluetooth. So I think there's lots of developments there, but I don't see any new technology coming through. Unless anybody wants to disagree with me. <laughs> Maybe one or two. No, let's keep going. Let's no, keep going. We have oh, another speaker. No, okay. <laughs> Oh, see, there's more come up now. <laughs> Is the microphone going anywhere too? I didn't have that very, 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 very long time, so she has, and over there, this is what she's doing. I know in the 1970s, Birmingham University, they were developing neutron activation techniques for diagnosis. Did anything ever come of that? Pass. <laughs> Francis? <laughs> and I'll ask her esteemed moderator at the end. No. The Birmingham work was quite significant. No. Was therapy? I mean, there was sort of uh, neutron capture, wasn't there? I think there was boron neutron capture for radiotherapy. I don't think it was a. I think they were using it for Okay. 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 No, not something that, uh, that, that is in routine use anyway. I think one of the problems was the availability of the neutron sources. <laughs> yeah. So at low cost. Yeah. Because I worked in NDT back in the 1980s and we considered that but didn't, didn't pursue it. But what about the resolution? How, how does the resolution of MRI compare with ultrasound and with CT? How does the resolution compare? Um, I mean... MRI particularly is, is SN, well, as is CT, is, is SNR limited in those things. But, you know, depending on MR, how long you're prepared to scan for, the, you know, we can easily get down to half millimetre or less. Probably with photon counting CT, we're probably down to 0.3 millimetres, something like that. And the ultrasound, I mean, again, you're just using a, a high-frequency probe over a small area. So, again, you can, you know, you can see valve motion there. So part of that is obviously a... Um, a spatial versus temporal resolution trade-off with these. But, I mean, uh, we've, you, know, you don't really come across the point now where doctors are screaming for more resolution. I mean, they like more resolution. Uh, just gives them more voxels to look at when they're doing the diagnosis. But I think the resolutions of those modalities are all pretty much uh, equivalent. You, you could, in, in MRI, I mean, there's a, there's a limit to, you know, you can, you can signal average, as you will know. Uh, but again, it just takes longer to signal average. Presumably the patient has to remain stable. Yes, yeah. Okay, we were just talking about the spatial resolutions in these different uh, modalities and saying we can improve the spatial resolution, but we generally need to scan for longer in MRI as well as, you know, scan more in CT, so we're delivering a greater radiation dose in CT, and in MR we're certainly looking at patients having to lie still for longer. So, you know, at the moment we probably have something like a 20-minute appointment for an MRI scan, so we try to get as much information during that time period rather than, you know, putting them in there for an hour just to get uh, 
even better resolution images. I mean, the question is, at what point can you actually treat something? You know, if you need, you know, 0.1 millimeter resolution to find something, yeah, that may be great for early detection, but you never know whether that's actually then going to develop into anything. So a lot of my thoughts are, yeah, you know, if it's right on the cusp of the resolution, is it, you know, are you becoming one of the, the worried well? <laughs> yeah, I understand, yeah. Uh, the, the, sorry, one, that one has the been poor, very energetic he's been very good, at yeah. the back. <laughs> Either he's got, you know, he's just stretching his arm for that. Yeah, for a very <laughs> long time, so I think he deserves an answer. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, with the advent of radiology and AI, do you think primary diagnosis by GPs or A&E doctors may become a thing of the past? <laughs> Again, a very, probably a very long, uh, long answer to that. Um, we're certainly looking at the possibility of using AI in the emergency department. You know, bone fractures, things like that. But, you know, a lot of these A&E consultants have a lot of experience looking at the images without the radiologist, and they'll get the radiologist follow up later. The, the AI is, is an interesting question. Um, you know, there was lots of talk in the original stuff. You know, people like Jeff Hinton, who you know, recently resigned from Google, saying that you know, there's no point in us training radiologists anymore because it's all going to be done by computer. Um, but that's really not where it's come to at the moment. And now everybody's saying, well, it's the radiologist who doesn't engage with AI who's going to become a dinosaur, as of those I've seen outside. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I think it's, it's clear whether we will ever get to the point of AI completely replacing doctors, I'm really not sure about. I mean, all of these AIs have great, I mean, they've got, you know, 70, 80 percent accuracy, which is, you know, potentially as good as doctors. But yeah, but people think it's a computer, it must get my, diagnostic, my diagnosis correct. And uh, the question is, you know, when you do get it wrong, quite what the judge is going to say to your algorithm or whether the computer scientist is going to be the one sitting in the dock trying to explain why the diagnosis was missed. It does happen, but uh, there's, there's a lot of ethical issues to go with that. Right, I Good. should go. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>